How did life begin on Earth? It's a mystery for which science as yet has no firm solution. Perhaps, says one theory, life arrived from space on a meteorite. Which makes you wonder, how did it get onto the meteorite to start with? Another idea is that the chemicals for life were there in rock pools on the early Earth. The water was rich with the necessary elements washed from the rocks by vigorous wave action. Something then put those chemicals together, perhaps a spark of lightning. It's like a page from a Frankenstein story, especially when you read that the chemical-rich water of the time has been named the primordial soup. What was this life like? Was it a simple cell? No, nothing so complicated. The first living thing was barely a contender for the label of life at all. But it could reproduce or self-replicate. And that is all it took to get everything started. After that, says the science, now on much firmer ground, one thing led to another. And in no time at all, well, a few billion years later, we're looking at a planet that's teeming with living things. Yes, life in abundance in all shapes and sizes. But actually, from a biological perspective, all remarkably similar. As if to say, yes, it's true, we really are all the descendants of a simple self-replicating squiggle. One of the things that's interesting about the whole story of life on Earth is the question of where God fits in, if he does. Some people have put God at the start of the story. He's the spark, like the lightning, which sets the whole thing going. In this picture, which is an example of episodic creation, God then ducks out of the picture for a few million years until he's needed again to make another tweak to the system or add a new twist. Another name for this kind of approach is God of the Gaps, because God fills in the gaps. When science can't explain how or what made something happen, God's there to do the trick. But many scientists, including many religious scientists, are not at all fond of this solution. Well, first of all, we have to say that we have very little real understanding about how life first began. You know, how did the first cell come into being? How did the first DNA molecule, how did the first genes come into being? You know, it's, it's a big gap in our knowledge. Now, it's not a complete gap. I mean, we do have some ideas, and there's some very good theories about that. But we have to say as scientists that we don't really know how that's happened. So the question is, what do you do with that kind of situation? Okay, now, some people kind of put God in their ignorance of their present knowledge, and that's called God of the gaps. Okay, so you just stick God in anything you don't understand very well now. That's the kind of God bit, you know, the bit that God does. I would want to say, as a theist, that's very unsatisfactory because as a theist, as someone who believes in theistic evolution, I believe in a God who actually is involved in the whole process all the way through from beginning to end, from the creation of the first cell all the way through the evolutionary process right up to humans and where we are today. I think God's involved in that whole story, like the author of creation, the author of the book. So. To me, it's rather unsatisfactory to say, well, you know, we understand all this bit, so God's not involved in that bit, but we don't understand that bit, so let's put God in there. That's pretty lazy, really. I think that's a form of intellectual laziness. I think as a scientist, we should work as hard as we can to fill all the gaps in our scientific knowledge. So I think we shouldn't try and put God just in the gaps in our present scientific knowledge. And of course, you know, if, if religious people try and do that, those gaps will inevitably close with the fullness of time and then their God will sort of disappear. I don't know if you remember the, um, that cat, you know, in Alice in Wonderland, you know, the, the cat that sort of appeared, the head appeared, and then it, it gradually sort of faded away. And I always think of the God of the Gaps a bit like that. You know, it's like that cat that kind of disappears. And that's the God of the Gaps. I don't believe in the God of the Gaps. If you look at the chances of life developing on Earth, it really is very, very slender. And so this is why scientists uh, believe, some scientists believe in multi multiple universes, because the chance of life is so small, the idea is you have to have many, many, many universes. Um, and it's just simpler to me to believe that maybe you don't have all these universes, which again you can't detect, uh, but life is really special and that God exists. So I think there are a lot of pointers towards God. We can't prove him, but I think my science is consistent with my belief in God.
Yeah, what the anthropic principle means basically is you look at how the universe is put together and you look at science and what it's told us about the universe and you think, wow, that's really amazing because it's so finely tuned uh, for order, in order that we're here actually, or we couldn't be here without the fine tuning of these physical constants that allow life to develop. You know, for example, if you twiddle the dial of these physical constants a little bit this way or a little bit that way, actually the universe would simply not um, last long enough, you know, in order for us to be here. And it turns out that the universe has to be this big in order for us to be here. That's a remarkable finding which we've only known about in the past 10 or 20 years. So this is not a god of the gaps. This is actually looking at the way the universe is put together and sort of saying, well, there's something really interesting going on here. You know, it looks in Paul Davis's words, Paul Davis is a cosmologist, as if the universe was waiting for us to come along. You know, it looks as if it was sort of the Goldilocks universe. It was the one that was put together in order that us humans might arrive and be here. Okay, so it's that kind of idea really. So it's as if you came across a story, a book, and you're reading the book and you suddenly realize this looks like there might be an author for this book because it's so finely put together and it's written so well and if it wasn't put together in this particular way, you know the book wouldn't be there and so on. So it's sort of that kind of argument really. It's very different from the God of the Gaps, I think. It's sort of saying there's a story going on here at a higher level from just the scientific story that needs some kind of an explanation. Um, you're a scientist and you have the opportunity to work with amazing materials, so why do you need to pray? Well, I think that, that's a really good question as well. So I think if you think about God as a sort of personal God, then it's a bit like interacting with a very special person. And so if you're interacting with a person, you want to talk to them or else you know, that's the main way you interact with a person. Um, and not only that, I think you know, before I talked about miracles of timing, but let's just think about how this might be achieved. So you know, when the Israelites were approaching the Jordan, there was this earthquake-induced mudslide. There was a marvelous bit of timing there. And I think, this may not be right, that God was interacting with Joshua who was leading them. And God was saying, slow up a bit, you know, or speed up a bit, because somehow the timing was going to be achieved. And I think with miracles of timing, humans are often involved. We're the sort of agents in that. And it's only that you can be involved if you actually pray to God. And so these contacts, you know, you're, you're, you're keeping good contact between God and yourself. So I think that's really important. Um, and I think uh, when you also pray to God about other people, then maybe you get prompted by God as to how you should react, the sort of things you should say. So if you think of the relationship with God as being a personal relationship, then prayer is sort of talking with God and also listening. I think listening is part of prayer. And uh, so it's a two-way sort of process. And um, science is dealing with objects and dealing with things, but prayer is an, a personal interaction, so it is very different. I would say as someone who believes in God as creator, then the task of the scientist is to really examine and investigate and describe what God has done to the best of our ability. Now the great uh, early astronomer, uh, Johannes Kepler, who believed in God, talked about his science as thinking God's thoughts after him. And I think that's a very nice description, really, of his science and of our, my science as well. I think about it that way as well. So all we're trying to do in science, as someone who believes in God, is to understand what God does, what he's done in the past, what he continues to do in the present. So I would see the creative actions of God as a God who is faithful in upholding all the properties of matter and sustaining the universe as it is at the moment. It's a God who guarantees the reproducibility of the properties of matter that makes the universe going on, behaving the way it does, in such a way that we can actually do science and we have reproducibility. I can do an experiment in my laboratory this week and I can hope that it'll work out the same way next week. You know, it doesn't suddenly change. You know, the laws are the same.